Lord, as we uh, come to God's Word uh, this afternoon, before we turn to God's Word, we'll be reading from our confessional reading. Um, at the local church, we have three confessions we hold to that summarize the teaching of God's Word. And we're working on Lord's Day 13 uh, today, as last afternoon we looked at Lord's Day 12. Do you read this responsibly, or just myself? Just myself? Lord's Day 13, and it's also on the screen for us to follow along. Question answer 33. Why is he called God's only begotten Son? since we also are children of God. Answer, because Christ alone is the eternal, natural Son of God. We, however, are children of God by adoption, through grace, for Christ's sake. And question 34, why do you call him our Lord? Because he has ransomed us body and soul from all our sins, not with silver or gold, but with his precious blood, and has freed us from all the power of the devil to make us his own possession. Now we'll turn in God's word for our scripture focus this afternoon from 1 Peter. We're reading from verses 17 to 19. This will also be our text and focus. I'll actually just pick up at verse 13, and then we'll, we'll follow the screen along when we get to verse 17. If you have Bibles, you're of course encouraged to have them open at home or, or here. 1 Peter 1, uh, we'll begin in verse 13. Give our attention to, God, to God's word. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Let's start the reading of God's word as we focus upon uh, God's truth uh, together this afternoon. Oh, beloved in the Lord, uh, one of the uh, cornerstones of Christian faith and teaching is the concept of redemption. What it means to be redeemed. What it means to be bought back. And that concept of redemption is something we can have in, in our everyday things. I had a, a rare treat in the last month uh, I don't want to make you jealous, but my car insurance company sent me an email saying that if I answered one question, I'd be eligible to redeem a month's worth of costs for my car insurance. The question was, has COVID-19 changed your driving habits? Yes. And I got back a month's worth of insurance. One question, and I redeemed one of the best coupons I've ever had. How about you? Ever had a time when you got to redeem something? As a child, maybe it was something special. Maybe you had some kind of special coupon. You could run to the store and grab your toy and put it down and look. My grandma, my grandpa, they gave me a gift certificate. I get to redeem it. And this is free. What does redemption mean in the Christian life? What does it mean to be redeemed? It means that you've been set free. You've been purchased. You've been paid for. As we consider what you've been paid for with us, the focus of our topic today. What does it mean to be redeemed? What does Christ redeem us with? How does God redeem sinners? And we hit the answer in the passage before us, that he redeems us with the precious blood of his only begotten son. Now as we focus upon this passage, the catechism hits two kind of concepts in the Lord's day. The idea of the only begotten son of God, and the idea of what it means to be redeemed, and what it means to call him Lord. And as we hit these uh, two topics, the emphasis will certainly be on what it means to call him Lord, that idea of redemption. Uh, but we'll try and draw out a little bit on what it means that he's the, the only begotten son as well. So our focus then, looking at what it means to be redeemed. What does it mean to be redeemed? And we'll see two things. We'll see, we, we grow in this as we see who we're redeemed for and what we're redeemed by. Who we're redeemed for and what we're redeemed by. Uh, our passage begins, particularly in verse 17, with the words, If you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourselves with fear for the time of your exile. That's an intriguing uh, opening to our passage. It's an intriguing uh, opening to our text today. And it's something that's uh, rather important and significant uh, for the world in which we live as well. This morning as we held our services at Living Water, we kind of talked about the idea of how the reality of death has become uh, more tangible in the world we live in. Uh, how whatever you think of COVID, whatever you think of the media, whenever you think of bylaws, I don't care right now. Whatever you think, 
Certainly, we all agree that the concept of death and the awareness of death and the fear of death is certainly at a significantly higher level today than it has been in years past. As we talked about that as a congregation, we said, you know, that's kind of a good thing, isn't it? Because didn't Moses say, Lord, teach us to number our days, Psalm 90, that we may gain a heart of wisdom? And haven't we been trying as Christians to have people in the world actually consider what happens to them when they die for thousands of years? Haven't we tried to pull them away from the lure of the world and say, hey, don't forget, only one life will soon be passed. What will happen when this life ends? And isn't this even an opportunity now as people have learned the, perhaps the fact that they won't live forever as perhaps an open door where they begin to fear what comes. And we have a message that can help remove those fears. In our text in 1 Peter 1.17, that's a little bit of the concept that's coming across. We are being reminded of the fact that the God we call upon, the God we are redeemed for, the God who has bought us, He's holy. He's holy. If you call on the Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Peter is setting before us the reality of who God is. He's doing it in a couple of different ways. First of all, please note with me, he's speaking of him as a father. I don't know if you've ever wrestled with the idea of whether we should approach God as father or judge. We view him as holy or near. Is he sovereign or is he a friend? Which way do we view God? As we see our text open up, we have these two concepts held side by side. First of all, God is called Father, this reminder from our catechism, where it speaks of Jesus as the only begotten, and then says, oh, why are we also called children? And we acknowledge that we are called children. When we believe in Jesus Christ, God becomes our Father through the finished work of Christ. We're never what Christ is. We're never natural sons, never natural daughters. We're always adopted, always brought from that background where we are say we were once darkness, Ephesians 5a, but now we are light in the Lord. Remember that one? Indicative imperative. Walk as children of light. I don't know if you were here for that one or not. A few weeks ago. But we speak of how we are children of God, brought out from a background where we weren't once near to God. We were enemies of God, hostile to God, and God redeemed us. He bought us. He saved us. But notice how for Peter, the fact that God is Father doesn't take away the fact that God is holy. And as he begins to open up this concept for the church, he says, listen, if you call on him who, as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear for the time of your exile. Know that there's a place for holy fear still in the life of the Christian. Do you know there's a place for holy fear even in the life of the redeemed Christian? This is our Father. This is the God we have been made children of because of the precious blood of Christ. This is the God who is our Father because He's redeemed us in the Savior. He's ours. We're His, our greatest comfort in life and in death, that we are not our own, but belong body and soul, life and in death to our precious Savior. He's ours. And yet, Peter says, you call on Him as Father, the one who without partiality judges the living and the dead, conduct yourselves in your time here in fear. I want to just kind of dwell on and open up with as we consider this. This is the question, who are we redeemed for? Looking at the concept of redemption, how redemption calls us, in essence, to live a holy life. How redemption calls us to live in, in, in a focus upon God with all that we have, all that we are to live for the Lord. And why that is, and the reason it calls us to holiness is because the one we call upon, the one who is our Father, He's still the King of Kings. He's still the Lord of Lords. The amazing thing about the gospel is that God didn't become any less holy when he saved us. He didn't become any less holy when he brought us into his house. You know, sometimes we have those children in the neighborhood that we know if they come into our house, our house will become dirty just by them walking in the front door. Maybe? Maybe you're, maybe you're one of them. I see the smile under that mask. You know, they, they, they come in and, and the house was cleaned on Monday or on Saturday. 
And by Saturday afternoon, the kids invite the friends over, they walk through, and it's been like literally two minutes, and nothing is clean anymore. That very by association to have these people in our house means we are no longer as clean as we once were, but that doesn't work that way with God. When God redeems us, he remains what is described in Isaiah 6 as holy, holy, holy. And therefore, as those who are redeemed, we are called to live before this God, knowing we are called, we are saved to live before a holy God. We're called to live a holy life. To live as if our actions count, our thoughts matter, the sins of our hearts grieve the God who loved us. Because he's holy. Even though he's our father. Peter doesn't just anchor us in who we're redeemed for as to why we need to live holy lives, but he also talks about what we've been redeemed by. Who we're redeemed for and what we've been redeemed by. These two things are the anchor of what it means to be redeemed and why, as those who are redeemed, we must live holy lives. Verse 18, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or without spot. Ever heard the saying, beauty is in the eye of a beholder? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder? I don't know if you've looked at the housing market of late. It's a lot of fun. My wife and I were recently looking at a possible place we might like to purchase. And thinking of making an offer, we decided at the last minute not to, but we'd actually talked to our realtor. We had it drawn up. We had the price put in there, and we o- offered over asking. Boy, we're generous. Over asking. And then we said, you know what? Actually, we, we kind of like our house. Our nest is best. Hold off. But we want to know what happened with this new house. You know that one? want to know what happened. So we asked our realtor, what did it sell for? He said, well, you guys offered over asking, but your offer would have been beat by over $100,000. What a world. When we put in our offer, our realtor said to us, I don't think the house is worth that much. I think you're offering too much. I don't think the house has that value. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, it seems. People are willing to pay astronomical amounts for things. If you've ever tried to buy a kitten during COVID or a puppy, you might know what I'm talking about. But whatever it is, we find these things where one person may find great delight in something and and, and think it's the the treasure of all treasures, and another person might find it's the very thing they would sell at a yard sale. That's just the way things go. People don't all value the same things, and you can tell how much someone values something by how much they're willing to pay to get it. That's how you know what its value is to that person. Now, when, when God is calling the church to holiness, and when God is calling the church to begin to live as those who we are redeemed to be, the children of God, he anchors it in the fact that, one, we stand before a holy God. The, the God we call Father is still the judge. He is still holy. He is still worthy of all obedience. And then he says, but secondly, you need to live a holy life because you've got to realize how much God loved you, how much he prized you, how much he was willing to pay for you. I don't know if you've ever had that, that item, you know, and, and maybe it's something you've treasured. Maybe it's an heirloom in your home, and, it, and it's set upon the mantelpiece, and, and, and one day it falls. And it falls, and it cracks, and the person who broke it looks at it, and they say, well, it's just a bit of an older piece, isn't it? it it's, it's, it's not really that valuable. And you pick it up, and you kind of cradle it in your arms, and you're like, no! This was my great-grandparents, and they passed it down, and, and we have held it in the family for years, and we love it. What's going on? That's something you value deeply. And because you value it deeply, you'd want to protect it. You'd want to defend it. You'd want to guard it. You'd want to keep it safe. How much does God love your holiness? How much does God prize you? How much does God want to see you living a life where you're putting off sin, striving forward for God, fighting the good fight, knowing the beauty of forgiveness, knowing the joy of grace. How much does God desire that for you? So much, says the Bible, that he didn't redeem you with anything corruptible. Silver and gold. Now in our situation today, silver and gold, they're pretty good, aren't they? They're worth a lot. 
And yet Peter looks at these things and said, listen, that's just trash compared to what God gave to redeem you. Silver and gold, as precious as we may think they are, they tarnish, they disappear. You can't take it with you. But when God set his love upon you and God saved you, he saved you not with silver and gold or with anything perishable, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish, a spot. I remember hearing a gospel being shared once um, and I was able to sit in the pew. And the man talked about what it would mean to give up your son to save someone. He said, you know, we can talk about this kind of thing and we can get used to it as Christians. We can speak about this in a very uh, kind of a glib manner or a, a manner where we don't really stop and, and think about it. But think about what it would mean. Would you give up your child to save someone else? Right now we live in a time and a culture where we are looking for, for more nurses, more frontline workers. We hear the announcements of how they need more in Toronto and they're hoping to have them. If it was a place of great danger, if it was a place of great risk, if your son or daughter was gifted and able as a nurse, would you rejoice in them going into that situation to work? What happens if it was more dangerous? What happens if it wasn't 2021? How much of it is the time when we've faced far worse viruses, plagues even? And the church has gone in areas of rampant death and without mass, have gone among the hurting and the dying in the name of Christ to show compassion to people in their dying moments. What would happen if your son or your daughter came to you and you said, no, this is what I want to give my life to, this is what I want to do. I want to be the one who goes into the hospitals, into the slums, into the areas where no one cares for anyone, and I want to go alongside these people who are dying of illness, and I want to show them the love of Christ and bring them the message of God's forgiveness, even in their dying moments. Mom, Dad, that's what I want to do. How would you feel? And and then if they said to you, no, listen, Mom, Dad, uh, I need to let you know it's actually a little bit worse than it sounds. Because the people who are sick in that area, they don't really like us. And the last team of, of missionaries that went into that area to show the love of Christ, they, 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 they actually were beaten. And when they got better after being beaten, they decided they wouldn't stop trying to help these people. They went right back into the people who were sick and dying. And when they came the second time, they were beaten the second time. And, and when they got better and went back in the third time, they came the third time, the, the people they came to help put them to death. How would you feel? Could you give your son, could you give your daughter to a mission that might cost them their life to bring life to others? And if you did, what would that say about the people you were sending your child to to save? What would that say about how you prize them? Don't say about how you love them. You see, because Jesus was just not just no ordinary son. He was the only begotten. And what do we mean when we say only begotten? Does it mean there was ever a time when Jesus wasn't there? Does it mean there was a time when suddenly Jesus showed up on the scene and before it was just the Father? No, we say. That's not what it means. It means from eternity, there was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. From eternity, Jesus was the only begotten Son. From eternity, Father and Son had perfect fellowship, perfect union perfect joy, perfect communion in heaven. And that God so loved this world that he gave that son, when he didn't know it was simply possible for that son to die, or even probable for that son to die, but when he knew it was absolutely required for his son to die, and not just to die, not just to be mocked by sinners, not just to be put to death at the hand of those who might oppose him, but that he himself, God the Father, would in the moment of his son's death turn from the loving embrace he has for his son 
and lay upon the shoulders of his own son all the wrath he has the holy God who's going to judge each man according to his works upon his own son that he might save you that he might cleanse you that he might wash you from all the sins you wish you could get rid of all the guilt you know you've carried and make it so that you are absolutely whiter than snow, pure and forgiven. And if God loved you with that kind of love, and if God gave you that kind of son to redeem you, then beloved, should we ever go back to the sin Christ died to save us from? Can we ever look into the face of one who loved us with such a love and jeopardize our souls by running back to the garbage. Forced him to the cross in the first place. See, Peter is calling the church to holiness. Peter is saying, listen, this isn't who you are. You're called to live now a new life, zealous for God. The one who called you is holy. You are to be holy as obedient children. Don't be conformed to the ignorance and passions you used to walk after. But God is holy, and you be holy like he is. Why? One, because even though he saved you, he remains a holy judge who will judge each man's work. And then two, because this holy judge bought you at a price, and the price was nothing less than the blood of his most beloved and only son. Don't go back to the ways he saved you from. They were futile, says Peter. They were empty. They led only to death. Christ saved you. Know that you're redeemed. Know that you're redeemed. And live as one who has been redeemed, not by silver and not by gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Loving Lord, this is why the cross and this is why the work of Jesus is something we are never to outgrow as Christians. That's why whenever we begin to think little of Jesus, we need to take note of our spiritual life. We need to realize we've, we've begun to wander. Because it's only in remaining near to the knowledge and beauty of our Savior that we understand the beauty of what God has done in saving sinners. And where it is that we learn to love holiness and hate sin in the beautiful work of Christ, the Redeemer, who died, beloved, for you. And so as we continue our study, as we continue in our ways this day, what is the calling and requirement that God sets before us? Well, first and foremost, beloved Lord, God is calling us to realize what it means to be redeemed, what it means to be purchased. And it means we no longer belong to ourselves, we belong to Him, and because we belong to Him, and He is ours, and He is our Father, and we call on Him, we are called to be holy, we are called to be holy and live our lives for His glory because of who has saved us and what He has saved us with. The blood of the only begotten Son. May God help us today to know what it is to hate the sin that would blemish so beautiful a Savior and to love the holiness, the righteousness, the joy, the thanksgiving that Christ has laid down His life that we may know and love and rejoice. Amen. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you uh, for the finished work of our Savior. Thank you so much for Jesus. Lord, we, we love you. Uh, we love him. Lord, we, we pray that you will help us to have greater knowledge of the beauty of Christ, greater awareness of how glorious he is, of his character as the only begotten son, of his character as the spotless lamb of God without blemish or stain. That we may know, Father, uh, certainly, Lord, your goodness, but also your, your goodness in saving sinners, that you would so prize the redemption of fallen mankind, that you would give so great a price to make us yours. And Lord, we ask forgiveness for all the times that we spurn and, and trample underfoot the blood of Jesus. 
and we treat it as a common thing because we want to hold on to our sin more than we want to hold on to our Savior. And I pray, Lord, that you will graciously move us away from that pursuit of sin and more and more to an appreciation and a joy in the love of God shown for the chief of sinners through the Son. And Father, we pray that you will help us to live lives that are holy, well-pleasing to you, because we know you as our Father, we know you as a righteous judge, and we know you as a glorious Savior who has bought with a price all those who call upon the name of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.